Welcome to the internet. Accessing subnet, non-compete. Credentials accepted. Select Cyberhost. Luna. Hi, Luna. Redbeard. Shocking. EJ. Selection entry. Stand by. Welcome back to the internet, the most terrible place. I'm EJ, and I'll be your cyber guide. But is the internet a place at all? Is the internet even real? Am I real? Are you? I'm not high. I'm just asking questions about communism because YouTube sucks. Now prepare to get jacked in to metaphysical philosophy. Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel was a 19th century German philosopher with too many names. Hegel developed what we now call absolute idealism. Absolute idealism. Absolute idealism. Absolute idealism. Absolute idealism contends that the best reflection of the world is not found in physical and mathematical categories, but in terms of a self-conscious mind. Hegel argued that the mind is the only thing that is truly real, and reason is the ultimate way to discover truth. When Hegel was first getting started in philosophy, folks in Europe were still kicking it old school with ancient Greek forms of logic like syllogism, which was perfected by Aristotle when he made the mind-blowing observation that A equals A, which is to say that A is not not A. But Hegel was like, bullcrap, this A equals A business is too mechanical and simplistic for absolute idealism. So Hegel set out to create a better system of logical reasoning to develop his new philosophy. He called this new system dialectics, and it was rooted in the idea that everything is in a constant state of change. Take, for example, a boy. According to traditional Aristotelian logic, the boy is simply the boy, A equals A. But Hegel knew that the boy would eventually grow to be a man or die or whatever. And the man and the boy are the same thing. The boy and the teenager and the man and the old man and the corpse which the boy would become were all essentially the same thing, the same whole. For Hegel, only a whole is true. Every stage or phase or moment of change is partial and therefore partially untrue. Things couldn't be properly judged or considered based on that one instant of existence of boyness. This is the basis of dialectics, which is logic based on the assumption that all things are in a constant state of change. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, our commie comrades, thought dialectics were cool, but they thought absolute idealism was not cool. They were materialists, and they believed the physical material world was where meaning and truth could truly be found for humanity. They believed that the physical came before the ideal, that physical circumstances predominantly influence our ideas. After all, the physical world existed for billions of years before consciousness. Marx believed that the material conditions of people had profound impact on how they think and believe. Now, that doesn't mean that Marx was a determinist. He didn't think we are all slaves to physical forces that are beyond our conscious control. He did believe in free will. However, he believed our thoughts are heavily influenced by material conditions. People make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given and transmitted from the past. Karl Marx. So Marx and Engels jacked dialectics from Hegel and merged that system of dynamic logical reasoning with materialism to come up with what they called dialectical materialism. I've made a video in the past about the basics of dialectical materialism. It's a long ass video that no one's gonna wa watch. And my partner Luna also has an awesome video on dialectical materialism. These books are boring as fuck. And you'll find links to both of those internet videos in the cyber description of this internet video. But for now, suffice to say that dialectical materialism holds that we must base our analysis of human behavior and society in the material. We must look to objective reality for evidence and any ideas we come up with must be based on objective material evidence. And I agree with Marx. I'm a materialist myself. In fact, if anything, I might be more of a materialist than Marx was because I personally have a lot more doubts about free will than he did, which I'll get into later. But first, let's talk about how shitty YouTube is. YouTube is a piece of shit. I mean, it does some stuff pretty well. It's 
actually a remarkable human achievement that such a platform could even exist. Since the first video was uploaded to YouTube on April 23rd, 2005, over a billion people have used the platform. Five billion videos are watched on YouTube every day, which equals to about a billion hours of watch time. 500 hours of YouTube are uploaded every minute. This is incredible. It's absolutely mind blowing that humanity has been able to create a communications platform of such massive scale. And given that it's one of the most used communication platforms on earth, shared by people of nearly every nation to make each other laugh and cry and imagine, given that it connects people across language and cultural barriers, considering that it allows us to travel and experience people in places of every corner of the world and beyond, given that it is used by so many people for so many reasons, I would say that it is one of the most important achievements in human history. Unfortunately, it's owned by Google and Google sucks. Google sucks. Google has complete authority over how the algorithm on YouTube works, which sucks since it's been well established that the algorithm has been proven to serve fascist content to people and enables white supremacists to build recruitment pipelines, which they use to brainwash young people into becoming Nazis. I've got a video on that. Link below. Google has complete authority over the copyright system, which sucks since they refuse to do anything about rampant copyright trolling, which has devastated the channels of many creators, including my own. I've got a video on that too. Link below. Google has complete authority over the features and design of the platform, which sucks because they're constantly removing features people love and adding features we all hate and that nobody asked for. I don't have a video on that. I guess that this video is that video on that. But for instance, like when they decided randomly and for absolutely no reason to truncate subscription counts so that the subscription count for every channel, even in the back end, was rounded to the nearest hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions place, which makes third party analytics tools like Social Blade, which content creators like me use to track our channels, absolutely useless. Or when they disastrously forced everyone who wanted to use YouTube to sign up for Google Plus, their failed disaster of a social media site that everyone hated and we still hate to this day. Why does Google Plus even still exist? It's a nightmare. Or when they added that freaking bell icon for notifications, essentially making everyone subscribe to a channel twice and forcing YouTubers to constantly beg everyone to ring that bell because people don't realize they have to ring the bell to get notifications. And then they made notifications completely and absolutely inconsistent and unpredictable such that it's completely impossible to know if you're ever gonna be notified about a new YouTube video or a live stream for your favorite creator or not. Chances are you probably won't be because YouTube sucks and now now, what has the YouTube team decided to do in all its infinite wisdom? They've announced that they're going to get rid of the community subtitles feature. This, my cyber buddy, is bullshit. You see, community subtitles allow anyone to submit subtitles and translations into any language. For my channel, this has been vital. I've had viewers translate my videos into French, German, Portuguese, Spanish, Catalan, Korean, Polish, tons of languages and this has allowed people around the world to engage with my content which i think is important because i'm trying to build international solidarity this also helps awesome creators like javi with cuñado de izquierdes to make great videos in spanish and english and share a unified audience it helps creators like my partner luna to attract a following in brazil the philippines russia and malaysia from her home here in Vietnam. And it's not just about those translations. People with disabilities like deafness also rely on subtitles to be able to enjoy YouTube. And this is thus an accessibility issue as well. So here we have a feature that millions of people are using to connect with each other and to access content that they couldn't otherwise access. And Google has just decided, fuck all y'all. We're gonna get rid of this feature without consulting any of you because fuck you, we suck. The reason YouTube gives for getting rid of this feature is that not enough channels use community subtitles. According to YouTube, 0.001% of channels have published community captions, uh, which show up on less than 0.2% of watch time in the last month. So let's assume that that's true. Considering that there are about 31 million different channels at least, that would mean that there are at least 31,000 channels that publish community subtitles. And the subtitles are used for about 600 million hours of watch time in the last month, which is only, you know, about 70,000 years of collective human life spent using these subtitles. No big deal, right? But you know what the worst thing is? I actually know why people don't use the community subtitles feature more. 
It's because YouTube makes it almost impossible to use the feature or to even know that it exists. For one thing, the option to submit subtitles is buried deep within the interface and it's difficult to access. For another, creators never get notified when new subtitles become available. And this has always upset me a lot because I, for one, appreciate community subtitles so much when they're submitted to my channel. I've spent a lot of time myself studying languages. I know how difficult translation is. And I also know how difficult transcribing is since I used to do that for my mom's transcription business back when I was in high school. So I really appreciate it when someone takes the time to translate or transcribe one of my videos. But since I never have received notifications when subtitles become available, since notifications do not exist for community submitted subtitles, it sometimes takes weeks or even months before I'm able to see that subtitles have been submitted. But Google didn't ask us, the creators of YouTube, what we think about community subtitles. They never asked us if we'd like to be notified when community subtitles are submitted. They never bothered to ask what we think at all. They just unilaterally decided to get rid of community subtitles and that's that. And of course now they're offering a quote unquote affordable translation and transcription service for about a dollar per minute in English and about three or four times that in a small selection of other languages. So this is gonna be devastating for the disabled and for people who wanna watch videos in other languages and none of us have any say in it. We can start a hashtag save the subs campaign on Twitter, direct it at team YouTube. We can contact YouTube customer service. We can make a bunch of videos about this situation. And we probably should do all those things, but ultimately it's out of our hands. We are at the mercy of YouTube and YouTube seems to be implying that this is a final decision because of course YouTube has all the power. They hold all the cards. It's their way or the highway, buddy, and we just have to accept whatever crap decisions they hand down to us. Because this amazing human achievement, this platform, which has been built by thousands of YouTube employees over 13 years, and also built, mind you, by millions of creators like me, is controlled autocratically by a handful of executives. This platform, which was used by over a billion people, is controlled by a tiny number of capitalist executives. And maybe you're thinking, so what? Who cares? It's just a website, right? It's not a real place. It's just a, it's just a thing on the internet where people watch other people do silly stuff. There are much more important things happening in the world, right? After all, thousands of people are dying of COVID every day out in the real world. People are protesting against police brutality out in the real world right now. That's why we should be focused entirely on the real world if we want to be activists. Isn't that what Marx would say? Marx, the materialist who dismisses idealism, would want us to be focused on real world practice, right? To which I ask, what about the internet isn't real? What about this platform, which has changed the way people engage with media in astounding ways that we're still trying to understand in a startlingly short period of time, isn't real? Several years ago, I came across this r slash shower thoughts post on Reddit. If I touch my phone in the right places, a pizza will show up at my house. It's funny because it's true, right? Because it is true. Touching your phone, typing on your keyboard, clicking your mouse, all these actions have very real consequences. Scientists have begun to discover the ways in which technology is actually rewiring our brains. Interfacing online has changed the ways in which we behave and interact drastically. People work online. People fall in love online. People have died because of things that happen online. Donald Trump was elected because of things that happen online. Facebook and other social media sites pay some of the best psychological experts in the world a tremendous amount of money to manipulate our emotions and to make us addicted to social media. Tell me that that doesn't materially impact the human experience. Last week, Breadbeard of Softboy Social Club raised almost $3,000 for an anti-fascist prisoners fund on YouTube. A group I'm a part of, Genstrike, has also raised thousands and thousands of dollars for workers groups and bail funds and unions. That money is real and it will materially help people in the real world. Collectively, millions of people are politically influenced online for better or worse. I think when people say the internet doesn't matter and we should focus on the real world, they're probably talking about silly things like internet drama, which is true. We shouldn't spend too much time fixating on individuals. We should be trying to focus on making systemic changes if we want to be effective as activists. But last I checked, 
Gossip and harassment and bullying and drama can all happen in the real world just like online. And you can waste your time and be counterproductive in the real world just as you can be effective and contribute to meaningful systemic change online. The internet is a part of our material reality. Like it or not, it's here to stay. You can't touch the internet, you can't taste it, but it's there, it's real, undeniably real. It only exists as countless streams of billions and billions of bits of data flying around our heads in the airwaves and coursing through cables, but it's just as real as a skyscraper or a factory or a gun. And the ways in which the internet are designed and developed matter. It matters just as much as the ways in which our homes and our streets and our cities are designed. If YouTube gives us a crappy user experience by refusing to notify creators when community subtitles become available, then that limits potentially thousands, maybe even millions of people from engaging in our content. If they get rid of the feature entirely, then tens of thousands of years worth of collective engagement will disappear. In this sense, losing a feature constitutes building a massive barrier between human beings around the world and a massive barrier for disabled people from enjoying, from learning, from interacting with other people. So when people tell me that the internet doesn't matter, that these subtitles don't matter, that we need to go out into the real world to make a difference, I just gotta ask, what about the internet isn't real? This to me constitutes a massive misunderstanding of materialism. The internet is a very real material environment which materially affects our ideas and our culture and our civilization and the course of our civilization. This same misunderstanding leads to all kinds of problems with dialectical materialist failure, such as the Communist Party of Great Britain dismissing trans people as idealists who are rejecting materialism by identifying as trans. Our view is, and it's not about people, we're not against a trans person. It's the ideology that's being pushed on people that says, you are what you think you are. Now, this is total idealism. Idealism in the philosoph philosophical sense of the opposite of materialism. It says, I think, therefore I am. Whatever I think, that's reality. Now, as a Marxist, we have to uphold the idea that, or the reality, that, that material reality is real and is the basis of our ideas. A Marxist says, first there's reality, then our brain interprets reality and gets ideas. An idealist says, no, first there's the idea, and then the idea produces reality. Now, life teaches us that materialism is true. <laughs> materialism can be tested by science, by living. Idealism, um, you know, is a human construct. It's what makes gods, okay? Um, this transgender ideology is pure idealism. It says, if I feel something, it's true. We've all got our own reality. We've all got our own way of, now of course we all have our own feelings. Yes, can't dispute that. But your feelings are a reflection of something. Your feelings come from somewhere. We would say that material reality exists and sexual differences between men and women exist. They're not imaginary. They're not a societal construct. This is a gross misunderstanding of materialism, one that essentializes people as defined by their birth genitals. The sexuality of animals, including humans, is obviously more complex than mere sex organs. And I'm not just talking about human experience, mind you. If you've ever spent time on a farm, as I have, then you've seen boy animals donk. My neighbors have a male dog which has an amorous attraction to specifically my leg. My leg alone. I don't know why it just has an intense attraction to my leg. There's nothing about this dog having a penis that makes it attracted to my leg. He leaves you. He doesn't care about Luna. <laughs> doesn't care about Luna at all. It's just me. <laughs> Believe me, I think I would have noticed by now if every dog with a penis were attracted to specifically my leg. The fact is, Animal sexuality is not defined by sex organs, and human beings are animals 
Thus, we are not sexually defined by our sex organs. If a woman were materially defined by her vagina and womb, and a man were materially defined by his penis, what would that mean for intersex people? What does it mean for women who can't have children or men who don't have sperm? If males are defined by their penis, what does that mean for a male dog who loves to fuck male dogs or my leg? Dialectical materialism does have the notion that the idea follows the material, but that doesn't mean dialectical materialism is so reductive as to deny the incredible complexity of the physical properties of the friggin' human brain. We don't even have a clue how consciousness works. Not a single fucking iota. We're totally in the dark about how consciousness functions. It's one of the biggest mysteries to science right now. So sitting here and saying, oh, gender is defined by your peepee -pee parts is just about the biggest leap of non-materialist bullshit that I can think of. Identity and sexuality and gender spring from the deep complexity of human consciousness. And in terms of physical processes alone, the brain is so overwhelmingly complex that trying to pretend you understand the physical material properties of human consciousness and by extension sexuality is massively arrogant and complete horseshit. Now, I happen to believe that eventually we will begin to understand the physical, chemical, material properties of the brain that make consciousness work. I believe this so much, in fact, that I'm not sure that I even believe in free will because it seems to me like the chemical, physical, electrical, perhaps even quantum properties of the brain are based on chains of event that are already set in motion and all of the matter in the earth and the universe is processing in a way that can't really be stopped or interrupted by human thought. That would seem logical to me. And in that sense, I might be, again, more of a materialist than Marx, and I might be more of a determinist than Marx. But that's a fucking whole other topic for another video, I guess. And understanding these things is a long way off for the human species. And even now, with our limited knowledge, it is abundantly clear that gender and sexuality simply are not defined by sex organs. Dialectical materialism does mean we should try to argue from objective material evidence, but it doesn't mean, hi, hey, your penis is material, therefore your gender and sexuality are strictly defined and you must be a man who wants to have sex with women and women only. That's absurd and just materially false. When I was a teenager, I spent a lot of time on the internet. <laughs> I know, hard to believe, right? But it was a wildly different environment. There was no Facebook. There was no YouTube. Instead, we had sites like GeoCities and AngelFire where we'd code our own websites by hand. We had MIRC, which is a completely non-commercial chat room system. It's basically like Discord, but it's owned by everybody. Anyone can build their own community on MIRC. It's very simple to set up a server. If you wanted to share videos online in the early 2000s, you had to get a server, set it up, and host the videos yourself. It was way more of a pain in the ass than the internet we use today. But in a way, it had so much more promise for humanity. Because every internet user had complete control over the spaces we created and the content we shared and consumed. Communities would build web rings and link pages which we could customize to our heart's desire without any limitations. We could manage these things collectively and democratically decide what was best for the wider community. Yes, there were more technical barriers, but there was way more democracy, way more individual control over how we experienced the internet. Back in those days, I dreamed of being an independent filmmaker. This was years before YouTube, so what most teenagers like me were doing was we were grabbing physical books on filmmaking, snagging our parents' Hi8 handy cams, and we were shooting these silly little movies with our friends, hoping to submit them to film festivals and become the next Robert Rodriguez. Rodriguez is a Mexican-American filmmaker who famously made a film called El Mariachi completely by himself when he was just 23 years old back in the 90s without a crew. And he went on to become a spectacularly rich and famous Hollywood director, and he did those Spy Kids movies inexplicably. His book, Rebel Without a Crew, was like my Bible. In this book, he wrote, as soon as you decide you want to become a filmmaker, you are a filmmaker, which I found highly inspiring. And it spoke to one of the big buzzwords about art and film at that time, in the late 90s and early 2000s, about the internet, about creation. It was the idea of the prosumer. Now, obviously, this is a combination of the words producer and consumer. 
because it was believed in the late 90s and early 2000s that technology and the internet would enable any kid with a camera and a family computer to become the next Steven Spielberg. In film circles, it was believed that the internet would democratize film production, that Hollywood would be brought to its knees, unable to compete with regular people making films in their spare time on their home equipment. Prosumer cameras like the Canon XL1 and the Panasonic DVX100 were marketed to college kids like me and other independent filmmakers who had dreams of becoming the next Robert Rodriguez. It was a hopeful time when artists in every field probably felt like they had a chance to make it big if they could just dream big enough. We believed at that time that for a couple thousand bucks, anyone could go to Best Buy and buy all the things you would need for a film production studio. And in fact, that ended up becoming the case. In terms of the technology, things have evolved much more rapidly than I would ever have expected. I mean, these days, I can fit an entire video production in my pocket, let alone having to go buy one for a few thousand dollars at Best Buy. A smartphone has all the technology I would need to make a film for 100 or 200 bucks. And that's something that I would never have seen coming back in the late 90s and early 2000s. But somewhere along the way, the magic of the early internet has been lost because we no longer have very much control over our internet spaces in a meaningful way. And it's all because of these massive social media corporations. Instead of making our own servers and our own communities on MIRC, those discussions have now largely moved to the corporate platform of Discord, which has the creepy ability to read through our messages and control what's being said. The discourse of various groups and communities has moved off of web rings and personalized individual websites onto Facebook groups and other platforms like that. We have lost that control. And yes, things are easier now. Facebook made it so that anyone could hop on the internet and share their thoughts. YouTube made it so that anyone can share a video or film with a potential audience of millions of people. It's much easier than it was 15, 20 years ago when I was a high school college kid. But who really benefits from these experiences? Who really controls these experiences? Back in 2006, I started my very first digital marketing agency, and I actually made a, a lot of money really quickly by helping small businesses, you know, boomers who didn't know what they were doing, advertise on Facebook. Back then in the early days, you could just make a fan page, make a post, and boom, tons of people would automatically see it. I helped a lot of business owners make small fortunes in 2006, communicating with young people who were on Facebook and similar online platforms. It was easy. You just made some posts, you'd have to get some good photos, be a little bit clever, and the customers would come rolling in. Then, in 2007, Facebook launched their advertising service. At first, I barely noticed it. I told customers not to waste their money on Facebook ads, but over time, things gradually began to change to the point where they are today completely unrecognizable from those early days of Facebook. Today, if you don't pay Facebook to advertise, your engagement will be pitifully low. You have to pay to play, and you have to pay a lot because you are going up against some very deep-pocketed competitors. There are billions and billions of dollars being pumped into Facebook and other social media advertising platforms right now, and a lot of that money is dark money. We don't even know where it's coming from. And you have very little control over what might happen to this platform that you're investing in. I mean, look at this new interface on Facebook. I have never asked for this. I would never have asked for this. It is garbage. I do not want any of this crap on my Facebook page. And YouTube, as we can see, is just as bad. Last week, I did a 30 minute video about how the YouTube copyright system is miserably broken and hurts creators. And now they're getting rid of community subtitles. And yes, we can try to move people to other platforms, and we should. Federated platforms like Mastodon and PeerTube are actually pretty awesome, and I've explained this in, in other videos going back years now, but they aren't YouTube, they aren't Facebook, they aren't Twitter, and they won't be until we can get enough people to decide to make that switch. And it's really not possible for all of us to make that switch right now, not at the scale of YouTube anyway. The infrastructure of federated platforms wouldn't be able to handle a billion hours of video every month. It's hard, if not impossible, for a bunch of working class, regular people to cobble together something like that on that massive of a scale because we just don't have the resources, we don't have the wealth 
of the capitalist class of corporations like Google. As of right now, there's really no viable independent live streaming platform at all because live streaming is extremely resource intensive. And to be successful, all of these independent platforms have to provide creators with the tools that we need to produce content full time. Things like monetization, people should be able to you know, donate money to our platforms and our channels. We need community features, which these federated platforms are currently lacking. Do you see what I mean? It's a massive, massive struggle. The prosumer promise has not been delivered. We are beholden to these massive corporate platforms. We are at their mercy, and if we try to go our own way, it will be incredibly difficult to build an audience on that massive scale because they hold all the cards. Not just the wealth, but the platforms themselves, the ability to communicate on a mass scale, the ability to make a lot of money off of that communication, and total control of the algorithms of all of these platforms and controlling communication, that's a big deal. As I discussed in my video on soft power, it is perhaps the biggest deal of all in the current neoliberal order of things. And unless we all start thinking about these things and taking them just as seriously as we take things that happen offline, it's gonna be very difficult to make any progress. So here we are with a lot of questions that desperately need answers. What should we be focusing on? What should our priorities be? How can we merge online and offline activities to make the world a better place? How can we take ownership of our online spaces and our communication platforms and seize power and control over the internet? back from these corporations. These are some of the biggest questions we've ever had to grapple with as a species, and they are only going to get more complex as the real world and the internet continue to merge, and as our consciousness becomes more drastically affected by technology through things like the internet of things, augmented and virtual reality, and who knows what else is coming down the pipe. All I'm saying is we need to start trying to wrap our heads around these questions now. The sooner, the better. Things are only going to get more complex with each passing day. And YouTube, YouTube does suck, but it doesn't have to. What if our social media platforms were more democratic? What if we were given more control over the algorithms that affect what we see, over the features that we have access to, about our subscription feeds? Wouldn't the world be a better place if we had more control over the material reality of the internet? Will the promise of those early internet days ever be delivered? Well, that's up to you, Cyber Buddy. We're counting on you to find the answers. And post them in the comments down below. And be sure to give this channel a like and a subscribe and ring that fucking bell. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitch and Twitter. And be sure to check us out on Patreon. Or you can also contribute on Ko-Fi or Libera Pay. Oh, and check out our second channel, Non-Compete Live. And you can also check out our website on non-compete.com. The only website on the internet. When reality seems too difficult for us to face, we retreat behind defensive mechanisms. There was the girl who always explained that she really didn't want something after she found out she couldn't get it. She was two-faced. Her defense mechanism was rationalization. Remember the boy who failed to make the team? It was because the coach didn't like him, so he said, for him, the fault was always someplace else. A dull tool, the wrong time, a stupid teacher. His defense mechanism is a special type of rationalization that we call projection. Remember the girl who could only disagree? She could only shake her head. Her defense mechanism was negativism. All of us are guilty of defensive mechanisms to some degree at some time. Knowing their dangers, we have a better chance to guard against them. When these poor defenses slip, and they always do, and we're face to face with hard reality again, we have other means of getting away. Remember the boy who couldn't dance, but who always brought a pint to the party? He was trying to escape from a sense of his own inadequacy. The next morning, he'd have a hangover, and he still couldn't dance. She was a daydreamer. 
she could dream that she was the most beautiful woman in the world. Time and time again she could return to it, getting more beautiful with each dream. But every time she woke up, she was face to face with her own face.